Hi, my name is Master Eth, and over the past four years, I've made dozens of reviews on indie games. I see indie games as a breath of fresh air to the industry, and a way for artists of all kinds to make living art in a sense. While I personally like them for the most part, there's a weird trend I've been seeing in the indie game genre as a whole that makes me concerned, and honestly, quite annoyed. We of course can't talk about this topic without mentioning the titans in the industry. Among Us, Fortnite, Minecraft, Cuphead, Undertale, and Fall Guys. These six extremely popular games are good in their own right, I'm not denying that. Among Us blew up because of quarantine, and is basically an online version of Mafia that a lot of people loved for its cooperative mystery aspect, similar to Trouble in Terrorist Town, a Gary's Mod game mode. Not only real world ties, but early online ties as well. Forkknife blew up due to its free cross-platform multiplayer, along with not only its many celebrities, I'm not saying they blew up because of Fortnite, I'm saying the opposite, <laughs> but that it's kept up pretty well with current pop culture, to the point where artists literally have concerts in the game. <laughs> Yeah, so that one didn't age quite so well. Minecraft blew up very slowly in comparison to the other two. But nonetheless, it grew a community on YouTube multiple times on YouTube alone, sparking creativity and basically pushing forward the open world sandbox genre that a lot of companies have attempted so freaking hard to copy, even to the point where Microsoft buys Minecraft for $2.5 billion. You did not have to do that. You knew you did not have to do that. How could you have done that? Can you live with yourself? What you've gone and done, look what you've gone and done here. For God's sake, you're a bunch of degenerates. Cuphead blew up due to not only its hand-drawn rubber hose art style, rarely seen in gaming, and its reputation for being an incredibly hard game that everyone made videos about, but that it exposed how some incapable game journalists couldn't even make it past the tutorial. I can make this joke because I am technically an independent game journalist myself, except I don't get paid. <laughs> except from the patrons, basically. Except unlike most game journalists who don't finish a game before making a review about it, I actually do. You're welcome. Undertale blew up due to not only the nostalgia of Earthbound, as well as garnering a very dedicated fan base that praises its story, characters, and overall gameplay. Fall Guys blew up because of streamers. Oh right, just like most of this list. While I did like each of these games for a time, they each have some things in common that I find to be quite irritating. Toxic fan bases, overexposure of a game, and money. When a game blows up, a huge fan base is created. And this group of people is so big that it's almost always inevitable that some of these people are going to take this game to an extreme next level. This reminds me of a certain person in the Homestuck fandom. And if you're like, well, Ethan, the Homestuck fandom is a comic series. Yeah, well, they also made several games, so technically now they're lumped into this category. Basically, this reminds me of that one time where that one Homestuck fan dyed herself gray with alcohol and Sharpie dye. <laughs> you know, that thing you do to tie-dye shirts. This girl was trying to do that with her literal skin. This is insane, because she wanted to be a troll from Homestuck. Hopping to some other fan bases, we have oh my gosh. who can be inconsiderate children who don't know how to take a situation seriously. How do I know that they're children? Because no sane adult would write this comment under a news report of a woman stabbing her mother 79 times. The Cuphead fan base, along with very explicit art. Oh wait, that's all of these fan bases and more. The Cuphead fan base has literal incest fan writings about Cuphead and Mugman because technically Cuphead and Mugman are siblings. So this shouldn't, why? No, stop. Oh my gosh. We've seen it time and time again. Maybe not the incest, but definitely the very erotic and questionable fan writings. We've seen stupid situations like this more recently in the Minecraft fan base, considering, you know, how large the game is now. <sighs> Do we really... Do we really need to talk about the Minecraft stands? I, re I really don't want to. I don't want to get cancelled for speaking truth. Whatever. Fine. 
How about this? I basically found a post that lists the sins of like super toxic certain fan bases in the Minecraft community. Although you can basically apply any of these toxic traits to any fan base really. Though this list is specifically for toxic dream stands. Yes, I said the D word. It boils down to the addiction of a creator, the close minded nature that people can't change, shipping miners, that's a yikes, doxing, also a yikes, all of these are yikeses, harassing and denying evidence. I'm not gonna deep dive on this specific aspect because my buddy Cordwit basically already did a really good job on that. Now obviously I don't mean every single person in the fan base. That would be ludicrous. What is... <laughs> What's the definition of ludicrous? That's not in the script. No, not the rapper ludicrous. No, not again, not the rap. I'm trying to find the actual like, it's a word. Ludicrous is a word, right? Amusing or laughable through obvious absurdity. Well, I don't remember why I was looking up ludicrous in the first place. So I guess maybe it makes sense. But when you have millions of people in said fan base, you're obviously going to have a few bad eggs that just take things way too far. That's just inevitable. It's also inevitable that I literally went to the fridge and got an egg for that specific point. Why? I'm sure we all at one point have gotten annoyed with Among Us, but we're gonna get to that. I like when an indie dev gets all the spotlight and the praise for all their hard work. That's the whole point of this channel. But there comes a certain tipping point where the game in question goes from fun to either boring or sometimes annoying. This is normal, like when you do the same thing over and over again. Obviously, the repetitiveness will continue the abrasion of said phrase. Obviously, the repetitiveness will continue the abrasion of said phrase. Obviously, thanks to meme culture, this image is so freaking small. This is... <laughs> it's so small! Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. I should just continue the video with, with this awesome <laughs> Obviously, my printer's having a heart attack. <laughs> Obviously, thanks to meme culture, that Gen Z thing where nobody knows what irony means anymore. And all we do now is spit out absolute nonsense that some people find funny while other people find repulsing. Stop posting about Among Us! I'm tired of seeing it! We've gotten to the point where even if we're not playing the game at the moment, scrolling through social media and or meme pages, because that's what Instagram is for, will inevitably lead us to... Which inevitably means that some of these popular indie games will die off after their rapid fast growth. Not all of them, but definitely Fall Guys, because who plays Fall Guys anymore? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, well, what if these games never blow up? Well, then there would be no money. Which, oh right, that's the next point. I have a hard time nowadays even trying to like AAA games. And by that I mean I don't really like the overall culture of the AAA industry personally. This isn't because I'm silently protesting that corporations shouldn't be making AAA games just to purely print money, though that's... It, it, Wait, that's exactly what they're doing. Which is why we get so many freaking sequels to decade-old characters. Obviously, there's the argument that people want to reboot old series to, like, up the graphics and make the games overall better. And that I appreciate. However, when I look at a game, I don't want to think, Ooh, look, this game is so pretty because the corporation making it is making millions of dollars yet can't pay their employees decent respect. No. I want to look at a game and think, oh man, this game is beautiful, and the art direction is so unique. The gameplay is fun. It actually does something new with the mechanics, and the story is meaningful, and not Action Guy 5 Return of the Cash Grab. Video games are art. And no, I'm not being pretentious, because the definition of art literally means the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, not the expression of Now, I know I'm gonna get some comments about how Hold on, hold on, okay, I'm gonna eat, eat, eat. Seriously, Master, have you ever played Elden Ring? Like, 
once. No, I haven't. I know it's a AAA game, and you don't like AAA games, but still, you should get it because you know it's really freaking good. Yeah, see here, here, sixty bucks, money, right there. I Take just it. don't care. I'm not even saying all AAA games are bad. I've played Ghostwire Tokyo for about twenty-two hours now, and I'm in love with that game, and that's a AAA game. There's just a concerning trend that I've seen in the indie game space where they are starting to borrow from the AAA scene. In fact, they've done it for a long time now. And that is where my problem lies. If a game is good, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's a AAA game or not. I'm just saying the fact that I think independent games are more impressive than AAA games. My case study being Fez, an indie game that took one guy years to make. It's a 2.5D platformer where you literally move the world as a puzzle. A concept we don't see all that much. Obviously there are examples of this, but it's not a well-known one. And the non-indie but corporate Call of Duty, the 20th installment that hundreds of people make a year where you go shoot the enemy, a concept done since 1992. I've had my enjoyment with both, don't get me wrong, because I love video games, but I value passion over money is why Minecraft is technically a triple A game now, or at least an indie game with triple A status. Thanks Microsoft, which for the longest of time, I couldn't figure out why I fell off of Minecraft. I loved the game as a kid, playing it for years with my friends, both vanilla and modded plays. Mods made it even more fun for us occasionally, and I even had friends that had Minecraft servers of their own. I'm sure anyone who's played Minecraft has very fond memories of it as well. Uh, do you see I this I'm fossil kidding. right here? Uh, there's a fossil up the staircase. No, I don't iron. see your mom. No. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, nice <laughs> Bo Burnham. Too. Hey, 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 um, I found your brother. I already <laughs> True. But ever since September 2014, Minecraft was now corporate. And that creative spark of Notch was dead. Oh yeah, and did I forget to mention that Minecraft now has paid DLC? When did this happen? Oh, I don't know. Maybe three years after Notch was bought out? Vanilla Minecraft over time felt more modded and complicated to the point where it was more about the brand new items and caves and creatures and places you could buy with mine, co mine coin than that original creative spark. But why were there more content updates? Obviously bugs need to be fixed, but why was there more and more being added to Minecraft over time? Well. Money was now the motivation, not the passion or the art or the creativity of Minecraft. There's actually a newer version of Minecraft that isn't Minecraft and is also made by one person, Danny the YouTuber. I bring this up because playing Muck gave me that feeling of really old Minecraft, where it was all about survival and creativity, and there weren't a lot of monsters or items, just the bare necessities needed, leading the world to feel truly scarce and adventurous. Muck is also a multiplayer game that's free, which while Minecraft has multiplayer, it isn't free. No, nope. this is why I have a hard time with corporate Minecraft. Because it's no longer about survival or creativity, and it's not about the world feeling scarce, because obviously, as you can see, it's been discovered. It's about the Minecraft trailer announcements and the press conferences. Which is funny, because all anyone remembers from Minecon are the awkward moments. I think the one reason why I like the indie space as a whole, especially with game development, is that there isn't an overarching corporation looming over said developers, crunching both time and skulls to try to get a project out on a certain deadline. I'm not here to argue against deadlines. It's how I was able to upload weekly for about a month until my wife had to have surgery and I had to take care of her for a few weeks. I'm just saying that in the indie space, you don't have to worry about your boss laying off 250 of you and your coworkers without severance pay. Yes, it's been three years and I still haven't gotten over that. This is why I'm so conflicted with the bigger names in the indie space. I'd probably use a Minecraft prop more, but I don't really have one except for a book, which I don't think I have here. Not because they necessarily did anything wrong, but that the problems that come with having a AAA status, it's that mental shift that happens when you go from creating a thing to all of a sudden profiting off that thing and making color clones of it until the cow runs dry. Oh, 
Like FNAF. How did I forget about FNAF? Oh my gosh. Don't even get me started on FNAF. It was made by one man, Scott Cawthon, who wanted to experiment with his game. So he decided to make a horror game. When it first started out, I thought it was cool that one guy made all of this. It was actually kind of impressive and horrifying. I didn't think much of the first few sequels, but it makes sense considering how popular it got. So popular it literally gave MatPat a job. <laughs> My problem now is that Scott retired, yet Security Breach was made. Not by Scott but by Steel Wool Games, yet is published by Scott, which means I don't really know how involved he was in this project necessarily, mostly because it's also been rumored that he's gonna hand off the reins to somebody. So most likely it's gonna be Steel Wool Games, just saying. This was the FNAF where so many people reported bugs, even Markiplier. <gasps> oh, oh, what, what? Whoa, whoa. So it's almost like this cash grab was an unfinished product that a company tried to sell, which they did, but a lot of people were disappointed with the amount of bugs. Funny how when ownership switches, now all of a sudden the production takes a hit. Oh, also, Blumhouse Productions is working on a FNAF movie. Blumhouse, you know, one of the most popular horror film studios. Oh, and also, apparently there's 13 FNAF games and there's gonna be more, trust me. 13, why? <laughs> this point is rather ironic, however, considering most indie games end up being cheaper in the long run than AAA games regarding their Steam price. But I'm not even gonna go into microtransactions because why bother? Microtransactions started all the way back in 1990 with Double Dragon 3. Hey, wait a minute, I loved this game as a kid. Apparently there were shops in the game that had real currency to transfer to digital currency to buy items and such. But because I was a dumb kid and never made it that far into the game to begin with, I can't speak from personal experience here. Unless we're talking about the NES version, which we're not. We're talking about the arcade cabinet. Anyways, the practice of microtransactions stretched farther than I previously realized, and it's transformed into many modern day games, both AAA and indie alike. Among Us is the perfect example for this, because with Among Us, it started out without any microtransactions whatsoever. But eventually over time, they added pets. And that's it. Wait a minute. When did this happen? I was originally going to make the point of how AAA games have it way worse with microtransactions. And they do, most of the time. But this slow progression of more microtransactions started with AAA's influence. Now, it's not just pets, it's clothes, Bundles, cosmetics, two different game currencies, and the cardinal sin of games. In-game currency bundles. In Call of Duty, there are these things called DLC and Season Passes. At the time of Black Ops 2, I bought the Season Pass for it to play with my friends, so that way I could get all the cool new maps. But looking back on it now, I shouldn't have had to buy the Season Pass to play the game, because I shouldn't have to spend more money on a game I already bought. It should have been all included. I know this is because they wanted to keep the hype up for the game so that way people are excited for cool new updates by dropping new content, but in retrospect, it should have been a free update, rather than having to pay for the game six times. The non-DLC game, the four DLC map bundles, and Nuketown, not even including all for the personalization packs, plus whatever else you can buy in the game that I didn't even know about at the time. At least Among Us doesn't have paid DLC for new maps. But even with this example, the microtransactions have gotten worse over time, so I would not be surprised if they started having paid map DLC. I'm looking at you, Cuphead, with your new DLC, and Fall Guys, although I still don't know anyone who's still playing Fall Guys. I think the only exception that comes to mind of an indie game with AAA status that still held up its passionate heart is Super Meat Boy. 
no, I'm not taking this chicken out of the bag. It's going to get gross. In Indie Game the Movie, a documentary partially about Edmund McMillan and Team Me, you get to see all of the stress of the deadline, yet the passion of Edmund McMillan. I was, I was actually really worried that either Tommy or I would die in the process of making this. And I know Tommy even talked about it too, like as long as he could finish this game, then he'd be okay with dying. This passion ended up paying off and sold over a million copies. He even talked about how excited he was to watch other people play his game. The reviews and stuff that we're getting is really neat, but seeing people play and hearing their reactions is just so much more beyond that. Like, it's just so genuine oh, and playing, heartfelt and, you know, you can, you can hear it in their voice that they enjoy it and that makes me feel so good. Shows that he really cared truly about what other people thought of his art and wasn't in it just for the money. Like, I, I can't help but think like I finally made something good. A kid out there who stayed up all night long for the game to come out because he was so into playing it and that even far exceeds my experiences when I was younger and to think that I could make something that could have an impact on this kid even creatively into thinking, hey, I know two guys made this. Like, maybe I can make something too. <laughs> it's just cool. Uh, it's, it's really cool. It feels really, really good. Remember how I mentioned DLC earlier? Well, Super Meat Boy has two free DLCs. Emphasis on free. Proving my point even further. Now, one second while I put this meat back in the fridge so it doesn't spoil. While some people see good indie games as a diamond in the rough and have a really hard time finding good indie games that even stand close to AAA status, that much is true from the Steam page alone. Like, there's literally a dating sim where phones go on dates. I love the indie space, but what what is this? I can see the value in the independent game developer space as a whole. It's important to be passionate about your art, but when money gets introduced, it can muddy the waters of the intent of the project in the first place. While overexposure can lead to the possibility of a less than savory fan base, yet underexposure leaves you with barely a fan in sight, it's a tricky game to play. Now as you can tell by now, my complaints are mostly with the indie giants. Ironic, because this guy is very small, literally fits in the palm of my hand. It's not that I dislike these games necessarily, although Fortnite was supposed to be a totally different game where the whole point of it was like a zombie survival thing where you had to build forts with your friends in order to survive the night and it looked really freaking good and I was following it since alpha. It's just that I'd rather play a game knowing that a person or a small team making said game were making it because they were passionate about it and had a story to tell in a unique way. Not because it's going to make them money, just for a corporation to inevitably snatch it up and make a profit off of someone else's work. Speaking of supporting independent artists, I just dropped two new albums, available in the description right now. One is a lo-fi album called Cotton Candy Sky, and the other is a metal rap album called Scavenger. Enjoy! Click it. Click the... Click it. Click it now!